Hello, everyone, and welcome to the How to Apply webinar for the fiscal year 2019 round of the NEA's Our Town Grant Program. You're hearing the voice of NEA Director of Design and Creative Placemaking, Jen Hughes, and I will be joined by my colleague, Catherine Bray Simons, who oversees the Our Town Program. On this presentation, we'll give you a quick overview of how the NEA defines creative placemaking, we'll walk through the major elements of the Our Town Grant Guidelines, and we'll dive into a detailed tutorial on the two-part process for completing your application, including a how-to on the NEA's relatively new, as of last year, online applicant portal. We'll talk about how Our Town applications are reviewed, and we'll wrap up by sharing a few resources that will help inspire and guide you as you continue working on your application. We have a few housekeeping items to note before we get started. You are all muted and will only be able to hear us. Following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session. And throughout this webinar, you can submit questions or comments at any time by using the Q&A box on the left side of the screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible during the time that we have left after the presentation. This webinar will be posted on arts.gov in the webinar section under the Home tab on our website in just a few days so that you can refer to it in the future. Please note in our next presentation, tips and tricks for a successful application, we'll spend more time sharing our advice on what makes a clear and compelling application. We hope you'll tune in for that as well. So let's get started. Some brief background on this program. Our Town is the grant program through which the National Endowment for the Arts funds creative placemaking projects. Since the launch of the Our Town program in 2011, the NEA has made 538 grants, totaling $41.6 million towards creative placemaking work in communities of all sizes across the United States, including rural, urban, suburban, and tribal. What is creative placemaking? The NEA says creative placemaking is when artists, arts organizations, and community development practitioners deliberately integrate arts and culture into community revitalization work. Placing arts at the table with land use, transportation, economic development, education, housing infrastructure, and public safety strategies. This funding supports local efforts to enhance quality of life and opportunity for existing residents, increase creative activity, and create or preserve a distinct sense of place. So it's really about connecting arts and culture to comprehensive strategies for achieving community development goals. Good applications are successful at one, articulating a community need or goal to be addressed by the proposed project. Two, describing an arts culture design strategy for addressing that need or advancing that goal. And three, making a compelling argument as to why the arts and cultural strategy is the right one and how it will support your community in its work toward desired goals and outcomes. Arts, culture, and design can play a unique role community development in several ways, by illuminating forgotten or underappreciated local assets, injecting new energy around a particular local issue, place, or economy, helping communities imagine new possibilities for a place and new ways to achieve that future, and connecting people across divides, both physical and social. Now we'll spend a few minutes on the grant application guidelines. Here's a quick look at the application calendar. The FY19 rounds will fund projects that begin no earlier than July 1st, 2019. The part one deadline is coming up on August 9th with some re new requirements from SAM.gov that we'll discuss in a moment. We strongly recommend that you get started on part one as soon as possible, as we know delays with this process can reduce applicants missing the deadline. Applicants will have one week to submit part two materials via the NEA's online applicant portal when it opens on August 14th. Our town has two program areas, place-based projects and knowledge building projects. 
you should be very clear on which project area you're applying to as they both have different eligibility requirements. I imagine that the majority of the viewers out there are working on place-based projects, things that are happening in your local community. The knowledge building category will be a fit for only a few of you. Here's a quick snapshot of the kinds of organizations we've supported through the knowledge building category in the past. Note, these are network organizations, and these projects are meant to help expand and strengthen the field of creative placemaking by building capacity among regional and national professional networks through trainings, mentorships, peer exchanges, research, etc. If you apply for the wrong program area, your application may end up ineligible for further consideration. When navigating our website, always be sure you're looking at the guidelines for the correct program area. So if you think your project is a fit for knowledge building, we strongly recommend you read descriptions of past funded knowledge building projects on our website. From the Our Town Guidelines page, click the link called Past Our Town Knowledge Building Grants. You'll find that in the box titled Our Town Related Materials, and this will help you gauge as to whether or not your project is a fit for this program area. If, after reviewing these materials, and you're still not quite sure, please email us at ot.rsecgov, and we'll help you select the right one. Let's now shift focus on reviewing the guidelines for the place-based projects. As I mentioned, I imagine these are, this is the relevant category for many of you on the call today. Our town is unique in that these projects are responsible to the National Down for the Arts Strengthening Communities Objective. When we advise prospective applicants, we ask them to review this language from the guidelines first. Panelists will be looking for projects that show promise for helping communities achieve positive economic, physical, and social change. In the FY 2019 round, a new outcome we're looking for is systems change. That is, evidence that projects will set the conditions for sustaining creative placemaking in their communities integrating arts, culture, and design into community development approaches for the long term. Arts engagement strategies may include, um, oh, excuse me, so good applications are very clear about how the arts, culture, design activities will connect to those larger strengthening communities objectives. Possibilities for art-based strategies that can be used are many, and we've provided a nice comprehensive list in our guidelines under the project type. So you'll see these slides are quite text heavy, but all of this text is available in our grant guidelines. So here's a snapshot of the variety of the arts engagement strategies that may include artist residencies, festivals, performances, temporary public arts, and more. Cultural planning can include creative or cultural asset mapping, public art plans, planning for cultural districts. And design-based strategies include bringing artists or designers in to lead community planning processes and design of cultural facilities or public space. Just keep in mind and remember that the NEA cannot fund construction. We can only fund the design phase of these types of projects. We also see projects looking to increase income earning potential for artists and creative professionals. So we have this category of creative business development and professional artist development as well. We'll spend much more time walking through case studies where these strategies are utilized on June 27th on our next webinar. For now, we'll say that we encourage you to think outside the box and think beyond the mural. So I'm going to hand it over to Catherine to continue talking about partnership requirements for this program. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> Partnerships are really crucial for successful creative placemaking, and they're also a core requirement of the Our Town program. These applications must come from a partnership that includes two primary partners, a 501c3 nonprofit organization and a local government entity. One of these two partners must have a mission dedicated to arts, culture, or design. Either type of organization can serve as the lead applicant. The lead applicant will be the one to be um, responsible for administering this federal grant. That means managing the budget, 
making payment requests, submitting financial or final reports. So just be sure that the organization with the best capacity to handle this aspect of the partnership is serving as the lead applicant. Additional partners um, are certainly encouraged. Um, our town applications often feature many additional local community partners of all kinds, uh, and there is space in your applications to list other individuals, organizations, businesses, institutions, et cetera, that will be involved in carrying out your project activities. So you're also encouraged to letter, uh, include letters of support from these additional partners, although those are not required. An eligible nonprofit must have its own 501c3 status at the time of application. We cannot support fiscally sponsored organizations. At the time of application, this organization must also be able to demonstrate three, at least three years of programming history. An eligible local government entity could include counties, parishes, cities, towns, villages, or federally recognized tribal governments. State government entities are not eligible to fulfill the local government entity requirement, and that includes state universities. Please carefully review guidelines, language, and FAQs on our website for more information about partnership requirements. And if you're still not sure, please feel free to reach out to us at ot at arts.gov, and we'll do our best to help answer your questions about eligibility. All applications must include a formal statement of support from the highest ranking government official of the government entity participating in the project. So for example, if you're partnering, say, with the City Office of Culture and Tourism, we'd require a letter from that city's mayor. If you're partnering with a county department of public health, we'd need a letter from the chairman of the county's board of supervisors if that's the highest office at the county. If you're partnering with a federally recognized tribe, you'd need a letter from that tribal leader. It's up to you to accurately determine who occupies the highest office of the government entity included in the primary partnership. These officials may sign only two letters of support. We also require a statement of support from the primary partner. This is a space where that partner can describe more in detail about the active role they'll have in the project in addition to um, that discussion that you'll provide in the narrative of the application. You may submit a total of 10 letters of support, so there's space for you to submit up to eight additional letters in addition to the two required letters where additional partners and stakeholders can express their support. Your organization can serve as the lead applicant for up to two Our Town applications. It could be featured as a partner on more than two applications. The limitation there is only that um, we're, we're also keeping in mind the organization's capacity to handle um, a partnership role on multiple projects. If your organization is currently being funded by the NEA, you may apply to our town in this round for a distinctly different project or a different phase of that current project. Grants for place-based projects range in amounts from $25,000 to $200,000, but keep in mind we're rarely able to fund uh, fully fund requests, although it does happen. NEA grants also require a one-to-one -one match. If your total project budget is $100,000, you, you would request $50,000 from the NEA, and you must also show an additional $50,000 of match funds from other sources. Uh, at the time of application, the sorts of match funds can either be confirmed or prospective, and a match can come from cash contributions, but may also include the value of staff time, in-kind donations, or the value of volunteer time. There's no recommended proportion of cash versus in-kind for the match. Um, this is a question we often get. Just keep in mind that review panelists are looking for what is appropriate given the nature of the project you are proposing. The match must come from a non-federal source. So for example, community development block grant funds, which are administered by local governments but are federal in origin, would not be allowable as match. Please carefully review the page on our guidelines titled, We Do Not Fund. 
Highlights include activities not tied to long-term civic development goals and strategies, projects that lack a clear arts, culture, or design strategy. We cannot fund general operating support, for example, for, for programs that are recurring. We do not fund construction, and that includes the purchase of buildings or land or renovation of facilities. We also cannot fund costs to bring a project into compliance with federal government uh, grant requirements. So for example, an environmental or historical assessment, um, we can't fund subgranting or regranting, although local arts agencies are an exception there. Now we'll get into the nitty gritty of the steps required to actually submit your application. All the instructions you need can be found on our website, www.arts.gov and we'll just take a quick guided tour. So first, mouse over the word grants there on our home screen in that black banner, um, and then scroll down to the link that says apply for a grant, and then uh, click grants for organizations, and scroll down to the Our Town section, and you click the red link titled Our Town. Select the program area that's most appropriate for your project, bearing in mind the different eligibility requirements for um, the place-based project area or the knowledge building project area. And then you'll find um, in either of those boxes the how to prepare and submit an application page, which gives a great overview of the full application process with detailed instructions. Really read this page carefully everything you need to know can be found on this page. Um, so quickly looking again at the application timeline, part one involves registering or renewing and verifying with grants.gov and SAM, or the System for Award Management, and submitting the SF424 form, SF form through grants.gov. The part one deadline is August 9. However, we strongly, strongly recommend that you jump on these processes immediately, especially because uh, SAM registration uh, now requires a notarized letter. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. These systems are not overseen by the NEA. They serve the entire federal government. So if you encounter a delay with these systems, unfortunately there's nothing that we here at the NEA can do. Detailed instructions guiding you through the Part 1 process can be found here in this link titled Part 1, Submit the SF424 to Grants.gov. So Part 1 is completed through Grants.gov, and there are a few things to keep in mind about uh, this site. Registration can take several weeks, so get started on this, this work ASAP. Exceptions to the deadline will only be considered where um, for, for issues related to registration, renewal, or technical issues with the system. We can consider situations where registration or renewal happened after the deadline only if you can show documentation of an attempt to register by at least July 19th. So please maintain documentation that show dates of your interactions with the system um, and, and document your efforts to register or renew by at least July 19th with uh, the Data Universal Numbering System, DUNS, the System for Award Management, or SAM, and or arts.gov. The NDA, as I said, does not run these systems, and therefore we're really unable to help you troubleshoot issues with these systems. Um, but fortunately, grants.gov does have support, uh, so does SAM. Um, so use the grants.gov and SAM call centers um, or email their, um, email their support staff and contact information can be found here, um, it's also spelled out under the Part 1 instructions on our website. In order to submit the SF-424, your organization must register or renew and verify its current registration with both Grants.gov and the System for Award Management, or SAM. Failure to do this um, may result in your inability to submit the SF-424, which is required. You will need a grants.gov username and password um, in order to obtain, excuse me, that you obtain during this process 
in order to submit the SF-424. Verify that your SF-424 was validated and accepted by the Grants.gov system. To do this, you can go to Track My Application to confirm the validation and track the, process of your, the progress of your SF-424 submission through Grants.gov. Do not wait until the day of the deadline to verify your submission in case you encounter any difficulties. Applicants are now required to send a notarized letter as part of the SAM registration and renewal process. Entities seeking federal assistance must mail the original signed copy of the notarized letter to the Federal Service Desk. Failure to do so within 30 days of activation may result in the registration no longer being active. This is a security measure in response to re a recent attack on the SAM website. Um, it has impacted the entire government. Uh, fortunately, there's lots of guidance provided by Grants.gov to help you meet this new requirement. Unfortunately, the NEA has no control over the SAM requirements and we're unable to allow extensions um, to the posted deadlines due to delays caused by these requirements. Uh, I recommend that you read the FAQs link um, uh, available there on the alert banner at the top of the grants.gov site uh, in order to access instructions and templates to help you through this part of the process. So all of this is to help you um, get to the stage where you are ready to submit your SF-424 form. This form is completed by the lead applicant and it functions as a kind of notice to the federal government uh, of your intent to apply for federal funding. You must complete this step on time in order to access the NEA's applicant portal so that you can complete part two of the application process. And the form really just simply asks for some basic information about your organization and the project you're proposing. Now let's talk about part two, where you'll complete the NEA R-Town application through the NEA's applicant portal. That system will be open for one week, beginning August 14th and open through the 21st. This is the more uh, substantial part of the application where you'll actually tell us about your project, your organization, the partners involved, the project budget, etc. You'll also upload statements of support and work samples through this site. We call this part um, the grant application form or GAF. Even though the applicant portal doesn't open until August 14th, you are certainly encouraged to begin preparing your application materials very well in advance. And this way, all you'll need to do during that week that the application portal is open is plug in your materials. Link to part two instructions here. Um, this link is titled part two, submit applications to applicant portal. By clicking that link, <clears throat> you'll arrive at a page that includes the applicant portal link which will open starting on the 14th of August. From that page, you can also download a PDF that previews the questions we will ask through the applicant portal. Scroll down to the red link that says in all caps, click here to download instructions. This, um, this is what uh, the covers of the GAF PDF looks excuse me, this is what the covers of the GAF instructions PDFs look like. So just double click, the, double check that you're looking at the right one for the project area you're proposing, either knowledge building or place-based projects. Here in the GAF PDF table of contents, you'll get an overview of what the application consists of. Part one is where we ask about organizational information that covers the lead applicant and primary partner. There's a lot of helpful information in the GAF instructions PDF about filling out this, the organizational budget section as well. Next is the project information, where you'll tell us about the project you're proposing and why your organization is the right one to carry it out, why now is the right time for this project. You'll describe major project activities, and you'll also provide us with a schedule of key project dates. 
project ob objectives is where you'll tell us how this project meets those strengthening communities objectives we talked about. So how is this project going to positively advance community goals? We also ask about performance measurement. How will you know this project is succeeding? And um, also about the target community you're trying to impact. We also want to hear detail about how you're engaging these folks through the community engagement section. We also ask you about where the project will take place. So that's the city, the state, the zip code. You can spe uh, specify more than one location in this section. Before filling out the budget section, be sure you have re reviewed the We Do Not Fund page of the website to ensure that you're not including any ineligible costs, such as construction, in your expenses section. Under Income, you will specify the amount you're requesting from the NEA, and you'll also share any confirmed or prospective sources of income um, that will fulfill that required one-to-one -one non-federal match. Again, lots of really helpful instructions for filling out this section in the GAF instructions PDF. Next, you'll describe project participants. This includes key individuals who will be responsible for carrying out project activities. You'll provide a brief bio and describe their relevant experience. Also in this section, you can tell us about additional partners beyond the primary partnership applying for the grant. These are partners in your community, such as other nonprofit organizations, local businesses, neighborhood organizations, institutions of higher learning, et cetera, that are going to be collaborating with you in this effort. Um, and you may include up to 10 additional partners. We will ask you about your three past years of relevant, relevant programming history. Either the lead applicant or the primary partner can populate the section. Um, the, the partner with the most relevant past programming history should be the one to fill out this section. Finally, under items to upload, you'll upload statements of support. This includes the two required letters the letter of support from the highest ranking government official of the partnering local government entity, as well as a letter of support from the primary partner. In addition, you're encouraged to share letters of support from other stakeholders in your community who are engaged in this effort. And you can upload a total of 10 statements of support. Finally, and very importantly, you'll upload your work samples here. Work samples are meant to help panelists visualize what you're proposing and to gauge the level of and appropriateness of your effort to the community you're addressing. You can show samples of past work that is relevant to your project, or you can share examples of the kind of project you're hoping to achieve um, that you may source from other organizations from around the country. The applicant portal is quite intuitive. It's organized with tabs and subtabs that correspond to each of the sections from the GAF instructions PDF that we have just outlined. We have a whole tutorial dedicated to helping you navigate the NEA's online applicant portal, where you'll submit your application responses to us. You'll find that video tutorial on our website in the box titled Our Town Related Materials. You'll access the applicant portal from the link we provide on the Part 2 Application Instructions section of the guideline, but I've also included that URL here on the screen. Your username will be your grants.gov tracking number. You must include the word grant typed in all capital letters. You'll receive this number when you submit the SF424 via grants.gov. And your password will be your agency tracking number or NEA application number. Here's an example of what that password will look like here on the screen. This number may be found by logging into grants.gov and looking at the Check My Application Status section. More information to assist you in retrieving this number is in the guidelines. This number is assigned to you um, by grants.gov at the time that you submit the SF-424. A confirmation will appear once you, uh, the SF-424 submission is complete. Your grants.gov tracking number will prov be provided at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the agency tracking number slash NEA tracking number to your application 
uh, will uh, be fulfilled one to two day business days after you submit the SF-424. Log on to Grants.gov with the Grants.gov username and password that you use to submit your SF-424, and then select the Check My Application feature uh, in order to find that agency tracking number. Note that the Check My Application uh, is a separate feature from Track My Application at Grants.gov. From August 14 to 21, you'll be able to log in to the applicant portal with those credentials, enter um, the application information, save your work, and log back in at another time to continue working or make corrections. When you're happy with your application and you're ready to submit, go to the very last tab, the Organization and Project Information screen. You'll see a Validate button near the top. You may validate the entire application or just certain sections. An error message will tell you if you've left any sections blank uh, or if you have exceeded the character limits. Don't forget to hit the Submit button when you are ready to submit your application. If you do not hit the Submit button, your application will not be received. The application portal closes at 11.59 Eastern Time on the day of the deadline. Be sure you've finished uploading your materials and you've hit the Submit button prior to that prior to that deadline. You can sub, uh, confirm that your application was received when you log into the applicant portal. On the screen, it will say submitted if your application has been received. If your application has not yet been received, it will say in progress. After submitting your application, you may log back into uh, NEA Go and make modifications to your submission up until the system closes at the day of the deadline. Remember to hit the Save and Submit button again prior to the deadline. You may print a copy of your application at any time, whether in draft or final form, for your records. And now I'll pass it off to Jen, who is going to talk about the review process for these applications. Thanks, Catherine. Hooray, you made it through the application process. And now we're going to share a little bit about what happens once your application is submitted and we receive it on the back end of uh, the NEA here. So we put together review panels every year that adjudicate our grant awards, and they are comprised of a diverse group of experts from across the country. These individuals change every day, year, and they perform an incredible service to the American public by taking part in this process. And you can see who has actually served on past NEA Our Town grant panels by taking a look on our website. We share the list of all past panelists there. They read application narratives, review statements of support, and also view work samples that you provide. It's important to note that we divide applications up by community population size. So projects that are taking place in large metro areas will be reviewed separately from projects that are taking place in mid-sized or small rural or tribal communities. And that's really to ensure that we can have the right experts reviewing the different types of community context. So we certainly love to see rural and tribal um, design, arts and cultural planning experts play a role in the review process for those um, applications. We have two major review criteria categories, artistic merit and artistic excellence. And all of the details about that review criteria are spelled out directly in the guidelines but we're gonna just do a very quick review. First is artistic merit. This is where panelists consider the feasibility of the project you're proposing and its potential to reach intended outcomes. For our town, they're looking at elements like the potential to impact the strengthening community's objective and supporting community goals that are identified in the application that are specifically intended to serve the need of residents. They're also looking at whether the partnership you're proposing seems genuine, whether you've got a great cost section of stakeholders involved, that engagement efforts will be carried out inclusively. So we oftentimes like to call the artistic merit um, sort of good grant writing. So you want to make sure you have all the components spelled out and thoughtful in your proposal. Artistic excellence is where panelists evaluate the arts, culture, and or design elements of your proposal. Here they'll be engaged, engaging the quality of the work samples you're providing and the expertise of the artists, designers, cultural organizations, and or the consultants that you are planning to engage in this work. 
For our town, they'll also be thinking about the appropriateness of those individuals to the work with the target community based on their background experience. Panelists will then score applications, and we will announce recommended applications in April of 2018. It's important to keep in mind that both artistic merit and artistic excellence are equally weighted, and I oftentimes give applicants the advice to just print out that review criteria, and after you complete your application, have somebody else review the application vis-a-vis -vis the review criteria to make sure that you're tracking towards successful scores there. So also just wanted to flag a reminder that the earliest project start date will be July 1 of 2019. So you cannot apply to the NEA for grant funds or matching funds to any costs associated with your project incurred before July 1st of 2019. So you're really looking out and planning for a particular project that will happen on or after that date um, for a one to two year period. So now let me hand it back to Catherine. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we want to encourage you to take advantage of the resources we have online for you as you prepare your applications. In that Our Town Related Materials box, we have links to lots of great resources worth checking out. So tons of helpful information is available on our Creative Placemaking Resources page. And uh, one a uh, really lo well-loved favorite is Exploring Our Town, which is an online showcase of 77 PATH-funded successful Our Town projects. We really encourage you to check this resource out. Uh, you can sort uh, the group of case studies by project location, by community setting, or by project type. And this is a great place to look around if you're just still kind of feeling not sure about what creative placemaking is or whether your project uh, is a fit for the Our Town funding opportunity. We provided the URL here for you on the screen. Um, you can also find this resource simply by, I don't know, Googling uh, National Endowment for the Arts Exploring Our Town. That, that should take you to it. Um, we also recommend that you check out our recently published book, How to Do Creative Placemaking, uh, which includes essays from thought leaders and practitioners from around the country on principles that make for really excellent creative placemaking in a variety of community development contexts and community settings. I'll, I'll mention also that uh, sample applications are available to you in the FOIA reading room. Um, so finally, after reviewing the links and resources we've supplied with you with here, um, and you find that you still have specific questions about the application process, please always feel free to reach out to us at ot at arts.gov. We are happy to assist you. Um, and now we want to invite you all to please kind of round up your questions, type them in. Um, we'll be fielding some of your questions um, now. Um, and while folks are doing that, I want to encourage you all to uh, go ahead and register for our next webinar, Tips and Tricks for a Successful Application, which we're going to hold on June 27th. And we're going to dive more deeply in that webinar into um, really talking about what makes a strong Our Town application sort of in terms of content. We're going to share some case studies. Uh, we're going to uh, talk more about those project types. Um, so please, please do turn in, tune in for that one. That's going to be some really useful info for you as well. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks to all of you who have already been submitting questions. Um, this will be a great conversation for our remaining time together. Just wanted to field one question that I saw came up a couple times about whether this webinar and PowerPoint would be recorded and accessible, and the answer to that is yes. Um, Arts.gov, go to our home button, and under that we have webinars. And so in the next day or two, we'll actually have this webinar archived up on our website. So feel free to check back and share that with colleagues or friends um, that might also be interested in viewing this grant opportunity. So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, so one of the first questions that I received was from Beth. And her question is, this grant opportunity open to fiscally sponsored projects? So the answer there is no. Um, uh, 
uh, lead applicants um, can be either 501c3 status nonprofit organizations or um, local government entities. Um, but keep in mind, we have space for additional partners, so that organization which may be fiscally sponsored and, and may not yet have 501c3 status uh, might play a role, a really active role in this project and can be included in the application as an additional partner um, in partnership with um, you know, ensuring that the, the two entities fulfilling um, the lead applicant and, and primary partner role are indeed uh, meeting those eligibility requirements. Great. So this is a question coming from Ron, which is a little bit more content focused. They are working on a greenfield master plan development straddling a rural town of 3,000 people. Since they would more than double the population over the next 10 years, they're interested in knowing would working with the local education, parks and recreation, and arts community to incorporate a design and placemaking program to infuse the arts into new developments be something appropriate for the Our Town program? Sure, that sounds fantastic. And what I'd highlight there is it sounds like you're really thinking comprehensively and about um, uh, you know, engaging cross-sectoral partnerships. Um, those are all really strong ingredients indicating um, a really well thought out um, proposal with lots of really deeply engaged stakeholders and um, some potential for that um, sort of systems change that we talked about underneath uh, the strengthening communities objectives language. Um, some promise to really deeply incorporate um, creative placemaking and arts-based strategies into um, planning work for this community into the long term. Great. And Judy was asking a question about the three-year history of programming. Can you just give some examples, Catherine, about what's required for an organization to apply um, as that partner in terms of the three years of programming history? Sure. Um, so think about it this way. Um, our panelists are wanting to um, have some evidence to um, review in order to assess that whether the partners involved in this project have the capacity to carry out the programs they're proposing at a high degree of quality. Um, so we want to see evidence that um, one of the partnering organizations has uh, a deep history in carrying out programs that are relevant um, to the, the proposed activities. So if you're um, proposing a festival, but neither um, applicant has had any experience running or managing a festival, um, you know, this might be something to reconsider. We, we'd want to see evidence of uh, capacity to carry out that kind of activity. That's great. And I, I think just to speak from a perspective of eligibility, the important part to remember is that the you must show three years of programming history. Um, so that's really looking back, you know, beginning in 2015. So up to the time of application, but you don't have to be a nonprofit 501c3 for those three years. I think Catherine mentions that as we walked through the eligibility requirements, but you do need to show programming history for the past three years um, to qualify for uh, applying to the program. So here's a question which is great because it's actually one of our frequently asked questions that we have, which is would school districts be considered a um, local government partner? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely, keeping in mind that you would still need the letter of support from the highest ranking officials. So if you're in a city where there's a mayor, we would still expect a letter of support from the mayor. Um, so that is just something to also put a pin in, is to check out our frequently asked questions because it's great to see that we've we've already addressed a couple of these there as well. Jen, Here's a question that we get a lot, too. Um, so this person asks um, that since we mentioned that construction is uh, not an allowable activity uh, for us to fund, um, is that also true for public art projects? That is not true for public art projects. So we can fund the construction and installation of public art projects. Um, what we cannot fund is the construction of a facility, the construction of a new landscape or um, a new park. Uh, what I wanted to really specify when we were talking particularly about the design project activities is that we can't fund 
the implementation of a design, but certainly public art projects we can fund and support. So great question there. Thank you for pointing that out. Here's another one. Um, can a regional planning commission serve as a lead applicant or a, a primary partner? Go ahead. So the answer to that is no. Um, we certainly love to see regional planning commissions come in as a tertiary partner or an additional partner on the project. Um, we are requiring that it's a local or tribal government entity that is actually applying as the government organization um, in support of the project in partnership with the 501c3 organization. Certainly a regional planning um, commission or organization, we welcome and encourage them to be a tertiary partner on the project, but they would not fulfill the requirements for a local government or tribal entity to be in partnership. Um, for the Our Town program. Catherine, can you uh, maybe respond to this question about clarifying the term non-federal source when we're talking about matching um, funds that are required for part of this project? Sure. Um, so um, the uh, NEA requires that NEA funds be matched with funds from another source that does not originate with the federal government. So um, funds that come through HUD, funds that are from the Department of Transportation, EPA, USDA. Um, it's fantastic when our work intersects with um, other federal investments, um, although the funds, those federal funds cannot be counted as matched toward the NEA required one-to-one -one match. Um, However, we can include, um, in addition to cash match from other non-federal sources, um, we can also include the value of volunteer time. Um, we can include the value of um, in-kind support. Um, so there are lots of options for assembling the match. And also keep in mind that um, you don't necessarily have to have um, the match sources pinned down at the time of the application, although you do have space to uh, sort of lay out your strategy for raising uh, match funds. That's great, and that is a great lead-in to a question we received from Colleen about the match. She's asking, can a donated building be considered an in-kind contribution for the purposes of the match requirement? No. So that's, that's helpful. That's a good rule of thumb, too. Um, think about it this way. The NEA cannot um, fund the support of the purchase of a building. That's an unallowable cost. And so the same rules that apply to the NEA funding also apply to the match funds. So um, no, we could not consider the value of a donated building toward match, unfortunately. Excellent. So here are just a couple of uh, little technical questions that might be helpful to revisit and clarify. So we have a question from Linda asking about the SAM registration and the DUNS number. Is that required for both the local government entity and the nonprofit 501c3 or just the lead applicant? It's just the lead applicant uh, that needs to um, undergo that process. And so a follow-up question is, if we did our SAM renewal before this notarized letter requirement, does the organization still need to provide that? So if you are already in current renewal status and you've checked that box and completed it, that's fine. If you have to renew it again, which will actually happen, um, I know that you have to update that on a regular basis, at that moment you will have to provide that notarized letter. But if you're already in current renewal status, then you are good to go to apply and will not need to require the um, notarized letter at this moment. Here's a question, Jen. Um, Kurt, maybe we can provide some clarification around the roles that state universities can play. Um, he asks, state universities are not eligible as partners, are community colleges. Let's just talk, let's back off a little bit and just talk generally about um, the role that state universities can play. Do you want to take that one? Sure. So that's, that's great. This is another one of our FAQs. So um, the, the real important distinction we want to put here is that a state university cannot qualify as a local government entity. However, a state university can certainly apply in the role of that nonprofit 501c3 partner. So, for example, um, we've funded projects in the past where the University of Arkansas Community Design Center applied in partnership 
with the city of Little Rock. Um, so the city of Little Rock uh, was meeting the eligibility requirements for that local government partner. And the state university fulfilled that role as um, the nonprofit partner and bringing that arts, culture, and design expertise since it was their community design center. In the case of local community colleges, um, there is a chance that they might qualify as an arm of the local government. I think that varies based on jurisdiction. I would always say in terms of a community college, it might be best to either have them fulfill that nonprofit 501c3 partner or um, have them come in as a tertiary partner. So hopefully that helps to provide a little bit of clarity there. May partner orgs be based in different states? Sure. Um, I think that's what really is oftentimes important to clarify in the application, if that is in fact the case. We've seen some interesting partnerships that have gone across state lines and even different regions. Just to make sure that there is a real sensitivity and relevance for the um, out-of-state organization that's working in that local community, that that is, you know, that they're working sensitively and in concert with the community and it's desired by the community. And you have sort of the expression of support from that. So that would be the only caveat I'd share there in terms of making a strong application. I see a couple more questions about um, our limitations around uh, construction and the fact that we cannot fund construction. Um, so one question from Lisa is how construction costs are defined. I just uh, went to our the NEA's general terms and conditions and um, looked at the section where we address uh, construction as an unallowable cost, and I will read to you from that document. Construction, purchase, or renovation of costs of facilities or land um, is not allowable. However, costs associated with pre-development, design fees, and community development, as well as preparing exhibit space, setting a piece of public art, et cetera, may be allowable. Um, so that should probably address a number of the questions I see in the queue about sort of the difference between what would qualify as construction versus the commissioning and installation of a work of art. Um, Think about, you know, the fabricating that work of original art, yes, we can pay for that. Um, the, um, and, and setting that work of art in place, yes, we can fund that. The landscaping that would surround that work of public art, uh, the lighting that would be shining on that work of public art at night, no. That's where we kind of start to draw the line around um, what becomes construction versus um, the commissioning and installation of that work of public art. And then thinking about the sort of more indoor exhibition scenario, um, you know, we can fund the fabrication and installation of exhibition materials, um, but we could not fund, for example, um, relighting an indoor space to host an exhibition. Um, hopefully those are some uh, clarifying um, remarks there. Great. Thank you, Catherine. So we are getting a couple questions just about um, support from the local government entity and who needs to be the highest ranking official that supports and endorses the project. And in this one case, we're getting a question about the city of Los Angeles. Um, would a council member fulfill that role? So the answer is no. Um, we should receive two Our Town applications from the city of Los Angeles. Uh, for the place-based category. Um, and that is the maximum requirement. That, that is the maximum allowable application per um, city or jurisdiction. And that's, that limitation would come into play because it would be the mayor who would endorse a limit of two endorsement letters um, to fulfill that eligibility requirement. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, City of Los Angeles is limited to submitting two applications. The County of Los Angeles is limited to submitting a, a max of two applications. Great. Um, I understand that the username and password access information was confusing. Um, I apologize for that. It's difficult to, to narrate that process. I'm sure it's um, much better understood uh, reviewed in writing. Um, so I do point out in uh, earlier slides uh, the links where those instructions can be accessed. 
Um, there's an overview page um, that really gives you the full sense of the scope of the application process, including part one and part two. Um, and then you can look at further detail on those links titled part one and part two um, in order to um, kind of read the detailed instructions on how to access that username and password information. I would encourage you um, just to really revisit our guidelines and all the instructions that you need are all there in writing. Great, that's a great question. We also got a few more questions just wanting to clarify the two different um, program areas for our town, the knowledge building versus the place-based projects. And, you know, I know that we have to do that in a really short and quick, limited time. But, Catherine, could you just share high level um, that difference? Again? Absolutely. Happy to. So, place-based projects are, um, again, the, the, the vast majority of projects we fund through the Our Town category. Um, these are projects that are um, based uh, in a particular geography or, or set of geographies. Um, it's a project that happens in time and space um, that is targeting, um, you know, to achieve benefits for local communities, local residents, engages local residents. Um, and uh, for those projects, um, there are particular eligibility requirements to keep an eye on, um, the local government and 501c3 nonprofit partnership requirement, um, the requirement for a letter of support from the highest ranking uh, government official. Um, so that's the place-based category in a nutshell. It's, it's most of the time what you think of when you think of creative placemaking. No, knowledge building is a more recent category that we rolled out in 2015, and that's really the NEA um, working to build this field of creative placemaking by making investments with um, regional or national professional network organizations that have the capacity to reach um, a, a broad uh, field of practice and really influence that field of practice um, to incorporate uh, arts-based and culture-based strategies for uh, carrying out community development work uh, by training, teaching, coaching um, those professionals to understand better how creative placemaking can help them achieve their mission and their work uh, more effectively. So, um, you know, we're funding the Trust for Public Land and the National Association of City and County Public Health Officials, for example, to think about how arts and culture and artists can play a role um, in achieving better public health outcomes um, when incorporating those strategies into park and public space design. Um, maybe that helps give you a sense of the kinds of organizations we see involved in these kinds of projects where it's really those um, city and county public health officials that are going to be the kind of target beneficiary and they're going to um, work together with uh, folks from the field offices spread all over the country associated with the Trust for Public Land um, to develop tools and toolkits that will influence those fields of practice to incorporate arts and culture-based strategies into their ongoing work. Thank you, that was a great clarification. Um, so we're almost at the close of our time here. I'm gonna do quickly one or two more questions. But if we didn't get to your question and you didn't feel like it was answered, please email us at ot at arts.gov. Um, we just had a question about, um, can our town support a project where an artistic individual is actually brought from outside the community? And the answer to that is absolutely, and yes. And you'll see lots of great case studies, I think, that illuminate both utilizing local artists, but also um, more broadly, you know, artists that might come from the region or from across, uh, somewhere across the country. So uh, let's just end on our final question. And well, it looks like we're actually at time. 3.59, so I promise to close right on time. So like I said, send us an email at otarts.gov. Join us for our webinar one week from today at the same time where we're going to be talking more specifically about content. I think a lot of the remaining questions are in that space and we're really eager to dive into those about what makes a successful Our Town application. So I just wanted to thank all of you for listening in, thank Catherine for walking through the detailed application process. And just say that we're really looking forward to seeing your applications come August 9th. So best of wishes and good luck.
Thank you.